Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for the opportunity that we have to just feast upon your word and see the wondrous truths of your grace. I ask that you would apply those to our lives in a tremendous way. I ask that you would filter out all of the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com, and we're going to continue on in our study of Ruth. We're in the second chapter. I want to try to give a little bit of an overview in this video of the second chapter, and then perhaps we'll go back and look at it uh, a little closer, uh, more of a narrow view, but I, I think it's important that we just kind of get a feel for the chapter and then see how that that coordinates with the first chapter. The one thing that I'd like for you to take note of here that I believe is of supreme importance is the fact that what we are seeing in this book is God's sovereign will and direction at work in the lives of these people to bring about the result which He desires. And here's what I find fascinating about the book of Ruth in particular, uh, what we've seen so far. Stop and think for a moment, folks, just how amazing that it is that God would use the events, the circumstances, the trials, the experiences in a person's life to describe or to, or to illustrate doctrinal truth. Now, that may not seem so astounding on the surface, but when we look at not just the individuals themselves, but everything that surrounds them, everything, you know, the air, the water, the, the food, the uh, the the, the, the landscape, the, you know, every single event, every single circumstance, every single thought that they had, every single desire that they had, when he orchestrates that in such a way that it so dynamically illustrates a spiritual truth, I find that utterly amazing. You know, for all that can be said about the, the sovereign grace of God, that God is sovereign, not man. I mean, there's quite a mouthful there, but when you really look intently at, at what we're looking at here, we're seeing something beyond amazing, in my opinion, taking place. And that is God using every single event, every single thought of man and woman, every single circumstance to illustrate, not just illustrate a particular point or, or not, not just to, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is to paint a picture of something that, that is so beautiful. He's painting a picture of how he's working in our lives today through a story of a real life event that took place in people's lives. And if we miss seeing that, I think that we are not doing the text justice. In verse one, of the second chapter. And I'm reading from uh, the, I, I like looking at the Berean Study Bible, so you may see a combination of that in the King James. But, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So now we're, we're being introduced to Boaz. 
And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now from a historical standpoint, from what we can come to understand and know about the time period and, and how the, all of this took place, it was dangerous for any woman to go into the field and glean. I want you to keep in mind that Ruth was not familiar at all with many of the customs. She could not have been familiar with many of the customs of the Jews, being a Moabitess. She's asking permission to go into the field, which I find interesting, and glean in whose sight I shall find grace. We're looking at a field, okay? It, if I think we would would do well to stop and think of how that Jesus himself used that picture of a field as as the world in uh, in the synoptic gospels we see that picture quite clear, quite clearly where that he gave us the picture of of wheat and tare growing together until the harvest the field being the world. And so now we're looking at, after looking at the redemption that we saw in chapter 1, we're, I believe that what we're going to see in the second chapter is service and reward. It just follows in succession. And just, I find, just that fact alone I, I find amazing. Israel is forced back into the land from among the Gentiles where and uh, I don't know if you heard that or not. That was Jelly Bean calling me. I, she's just going to have to wait for a little while. Israel is forced back into the land from Moab where that the family had fled because of famine Okay, I pointed out that famine, you can look at that. There's no question in my mind that this was a, an actual physical famine. But be, it, there is a spiritual famine as well. And Israel is forced, not, not asked to go, but forced back into the land from, from strange land, a strange land where that she had fled, her and her husband and her two sons had fled because of famine. A land that God had not blessed. I, I, I want you to try to keep in mind, in the forefront of your mind as we go through this, our lives, our relationship with God Today, I know that there is a Jewish, I know this is a Jewish context, and I know that there's an application, a strict application as far as Israel is concerned. But folks, listen to me. There is also an application for the church here. God had one of His own in a strange land. Okay? Uh, I think of the uh, what the best example would be the prodigal son, and, and it was it was in that land apart from God that there resided one whom God had redeemed. It was one of His own. I'm talking about Ruth here, but it was not to be without cost, okay, for Israel or Naomi. Because it resulted in death and suffering. Naomi lost her husband and her two sons. And if you look at Naomi as a picture 
of Israel, then believing that God's hand is against her, she's soon to realize that the God of Israel has purpose to bless and provide for through a kinsman, okay, since, since they were related by marriage. Wow. Uh, and just as God used Israel to bless the Gentile, He used the Gentile to bless Israel in her service toward the kinsman. It is impossible, folks, to separate, in my opinion, and I'm not asking anyone to agree with me here, but it, it is, I find it impossible to separate the story, the events, the circumstances that we're looking at here from doctrine, bibli sound biblical doctrine, teaching, okay? So the text says that, and she went and she came and she gleaned in the field after the reapers, after the reapers. Well, she wasn't supposed to do that. That was not typically the custom. Now, I don't believe that the text is saying that that's what she did. I know it sounds like it. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reaper. It sounds as if when we're reading this, that this is what she was actually doing. What we'll find out is, is it's not what she did. And her hap was to light, I don't know what your Bible says, her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Happenstance. Okay. Now, you can read that as if, well, it, okay, it was, it, it was, it was just by circumstances. It was just by chance, just by chance that she, she just happened to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. It was just of all the fields that there were, and believe me, there were a lot of fields. They weren't marked by fences. Most of them were fairly small. All the owners knew. Uh, their field, they knew where the borders were, they knew where it began, they knew where it ended, and she went out and she just happened to land on that. And we don't worship the God of chance. The text is not saying what it sounds like it might be saying, that it was just by, by happenstance that she lighted on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. We're looking at a sovereign God here who directed Ruth to just happen to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from, Bruce, from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. Typical Jewish greeting. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. Typical Jewish response. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, the foreman, we're looking at the foreman here. Boaz said to the foreman, whose damsel is this? The word damsel being servant. Whose servant is this? And the foreman then said, the, the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, this is not Ruth talking here. This is still, we're still looking at, at the foreman speaking here. The foreman is telling Boaz, she said, Get that. I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried uh, a little in the house. She got there early. Uh, it's useless to try to speculate and put times on that. 
but I'm sure that she must have gotten there early. She found, she just happened to land on the field that belonged to Boaz. She asked the foreman, okay? She's beseeching the foreman. The word pray, it's beseech, it's to implore, it's to ask earnestly, earnestly request, let me glean and gather after the reapers. Well, of course, the foreman would have known that that's just not the way that that works. So she came and she continued. She stayed there from the, even the morning until now. When was it that Boaz arrived? Probably somewhere around noon, as we'll go on to see because they're, they're going to eat lunch. Verse 8, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Man, there, there's, there's so, much, so much that can be said here about, about hearing. If you follow this channel, this ministry, you know what the position of this ministry is when it comes to hearing the Word of God. My sheep hear my voice. Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not, Boaz says, to glean in another field. I wish that I had time to, to actually go through this verse by verse, word by word, so just drag our feet straight through this so that all of, all of the, the, the real solid truth of the text could be talked about. Don't glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here. Remain. The word there is remain. Remain here fast by my maidens, my other servants. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. Okay? And go thou after them. Have I not charged... The young men, uh, let me back up here, okay? Just a minute. This is so packed, folks, full of doctrinal truth. We're looking at hearing, which only his sheep can do, not gleaning in another field, okay? We don't glean in another field. When, when we are involved, when God, in the service of God, in harvesting, Okay, we don't glean in another field. We don't go away from there. We remain there. We remain there fast by our fellow servants. Okay, our focus, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. So Boaz is, is now talk, speaking in reference to focus and, and preoccupation. What is Ruth's preoccupation to be? And go out thou after them, and have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So we see protection, the protection of God, not just in Ruth's life, but in our lives. And when thou art athirst, well, you know, and of course, in anything that you folks do, if you go out and you work in the field, if you do, if you work and doing anything, you're going to get thirsty. That's just a fact of life. It shouldn't be so amazing that, but I, I, I but I, my goodness, I, I find it so amazing how the, the Lord, it's not just these people's, I'm trying to get you to understand, it's not just these people's lives that He's using to drive home spiritual truth, to, to reinforce spiritual truth, to, uh, to paint a picture of biblical doctrine. He's using everything, not just the people's lives themselves, but He's using the field. He's using water. Okay? He's using every single thing that takes place in their lives to take and paint a beautiful, beautiful picture of your life and how that you 
and Christ are related, how He works in your life, what we are to be involved in, what we are not. Do you see that? Do you see that? I hope, dearly beloved, I hope you see that. When thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. The same water. Not, not, a different, not different water. The same water, folks. And we feast upon the same book, the same Word of God. We receive, the, all of us have received the same Spirit. Okay? If you, if you want to take and look at water as the Holy Spirit, drink of that which the young men have drawn, not your own. Okay? That's what I'm seeing in the text. A sovereign God was directing the Gentile to a particular field owned by this kinsman to harvest. Owned. That was his field. Okay? It was not by chance or it wasn't by human will that she wound up where she was. She beseeches an Israelite in charge of the reapers to work close to him. But that request was not the custom. And she waited patiently, get this, waited patiently for the owner of the field to grant her permission to do so. We're looking at service here. She waited patiently for the owner of the field to grant her permission to do so, which she did when he arrived. The owner of the field had knowledge concerning who she was and insisted the owner insisted that she understand that he desired nothing more than to fulfill her desire and then some Are, did you did you hear me okay and did you know that Christ Jesus now this is my opinion I'll just, I'm just going to put it out there out there it is my understanding, it is my belief, it is my opinion that, the, that there is nothing that, that Christ will delight more in than fulfilling every single desire of His people's hearts. Not just now, but in the future. And we see that. We see that picture in, in Boaz. In the relationship between Boaz and Ruth. He desired nothing more than to fulfill her desire and then some beyond an abundance. Are you seeing that? And it was there that she was commanded. It wasn't a request. She was commanded to remain, to abide. We are, we are to abide in Him. He the vine, we the branches. And reap with others of her own kind. He promises her protection. And He commands her to drink of the same water, the Word of the Holy Spirit, as His people Israel were. She's a Moabitess. They are Israelites. But they, are, they drink of the same water, Jew and Gentile. Do you see that? Then she fell on her face and she bowed herself to the ground. So we're looking at worship. And said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Well, first of all, her attitude is one of respect, appreciation, uh, reverence. That shouldn't surprise us. When God's grace is shown to us, we see the same thing. Our attitude is one of respect, reverence, appreciation. She seeks to understand why, why that he would be showing a stranger, a stranger to his people, favor or grace. 
why would he be showing a stranger to his people grace? Does that, does that not make you think of us in, in relationship to Israel today? As well as his desire to even know her. That thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger. As I said in the beginning, it's, it seems almost impossible to, to separate doctrinal, sound doctrinal, spiritual truth from the real life, physical picture, the story of what we see taking place in, in, these, in the lives of these individuals. How can we take and separate the two? It's impossible. Verse 11, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law, this is his response, since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of your birth, the, the text says thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not before, heretofore. What I'm seeing in that is that he is making, he's, he, Boaz is making it clear that he knows exactly, get this, he knows exactly who she is, where she, where she came from. He knows where she came from. He knows what she did in the past. He knows how that she had been a blessing to his people. He he, he understood, he fully had knowledge of and understood what it cost her to be there as well as the difficulties, the trials, the sufferings of her now being where she was, including the fact that she not only now knew His people, Israel, but that she was now one of his own people as well. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Chapter 1, Redemption. Chapter 2, Service and Reward. He then goes on to declare that her labor would be fully re rewarded Fully rewarded. Emphasizing once again the fact that she would be protected by a God whom she had come to trust was faithful. That God was faithful. Verse 13, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight. Isn't it interesting? She's... She's beseeching Boaz. She's she, she continues to request from Boaz that she find grace. Grace, folks, in our lives is, is a continuous desire. We continually desire God's grace in our lives. For that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid. Friendly. Spoken friendly. Comforted, spoken friendly. Does God speak friendly to us? Does God comfort us? Does the Holy Spirit comfort us? Yes. Does God speak friendly to us. Yes. Yes. Though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. She beseeches his favor. It's not surprising that this Gentile would express 
gladness because of the comfort and the friendliness that she's received, where she then professes to feel somewhat inferior to those who were his people, the Israelites. So, what does Boaz say? Verse 14, And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn. He, he passed parched corn to Ruth, and she did eat, and was sufficed and left. Okay? She left. Folks, do you see how God is, is using He God being the author, the Holy Spirit being the author of this book, God the Holy Spirit, not Samuel or not whoever it was that wrote Ruth. God is is speaking to you and to me describing a story in which everything that he by God's sovereign will he chose to use to describe this story is jam-packed full of spiritual truth we're going to see that even even in the, even in these few sentences verse 15 but when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. Wow. That was not the custom. That was not the custom. I, I don't even want to go into speculating how as to or you, I spent some time the past several days thinking how that the, the foreman and these other reapers, what they must have thought of Ruth. How dare her, she th you know think that she could do or even ask to do what she wanted to do. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. Let some of it fall on purpose and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. First of all, folks, this is not an invite, okay? It's not an invite. But it, it, is, it, it was a command, Boaz commanding her to eat. Take note of that fact. He didn't just invite her, you know, to eat, to feast, along with him and the other reapers of the same food. Were that she not only became satisfied, but she had food left over. An abundance, which we, we soon see becomes a blessing for someone else, a blessing for Naomi. On that, and that was on top of the 64 pounds. Yeah, I, I actually calculated it. 64 pounds of unroasted, unprepared dried grain. It wasn't prepared when Ruth brought it back to Naomi. It wasn't prepared to eat that she took back to Naomi. Note how that, that after becoming full or satisfied, she goes back to work. She goes back to work. You know, we know food is necessary for, uh, for any type of labor, any type of work. So food is necessary, in, in this case, for her work in harvesting. Food, the Word of God, is necessary for our work in the field. Are, are you seeing that? And don't miss seeing how that Boaz instructed that her method of harvesting be allowed, not according to the typical, you know, an expected law governing gleaners, which was designed to accommodate the poor who gleaned the fields. We are not poor, folks, in Christ. 
and how the do you, do, you, do you, are you start are you getting this are you seeing how it's just it is just one thing after another throughout the story that that god is driving home spiritual truths painting a picture a beautiful one of our relationship with god not just israel's but ours as well and he's and he's doing it through every single thing that occurs is that's what i want you to see Boaz instructed that her method of harvesting be allowed it had nothing to do with the traditional customer law of, of Israel. Do you see that? that? Which governed gleaners. Which was designed to accommodate the poor. Do you see that? And how that they were commanded to ensure that she not be harmed or harassed, but receive an abundance. An abundance without rebuke, without scolding, without chastisement, without reprimands, without criticisms or lectures. And it gets even more interesting. Ruth is being given a lesson on things here, folks. You can't miss it in the text. Take time to sit down and take a close look at it. She's being given a lesson on things such as abiding, remaining, following, imitating, preoccupation, having the right focus, with his field alone, not others. The purity of doctrine, the, the, the need for unity in, in serving and, and worshiping together. Labor being the result of God's grace or favor. Hello, please see that. Labor being the result of his favor, his grace not some condition whereby she might receive it. In the first chapter, we saw redemption. In the second, we see what naturally follows as a result, which is service and reward. These were people's lives, which God directed in such a dynamic way that they would come to reflect the very work of God itself. Please don't miss that. If we go all the way back and we look at Elimelech and Naomi losing her, her husband and her two sons, how that going off into a land that God had cursed resulted in death, just I remind you of 2 Corinthians 4.12, what Paul says, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Okay? Our, people, Christians love talking about you know, carrying our cross. Okay? Do they really understand what that means? For, you, for you, us to be put into service by God for, for others, for the sake of others, is going to come at a cost. Because God will take us through circumstances in which He will teach us it's not our will but his it's not what we want i'm sure that if we if we could all go back and ask naomi which would you rather have would you rather have not left bethlehem yeah, yeah i think i'd rather stayed here than have you know having gone off to moab and losing my husband and my two kids death works in us but life in you you can almost read Reword that to say, death work, worketh in Naomi, but life in Ruth. Do you see that, folks? It was because of how God worked in, in Naomi's life. And, and even in one who believed that God's hand was against her, hello. God's ne hand was never against Naomi. 
he allowed, he, he ordained, in fact, what, what occurred in Naomi's life in order to redeem, bring back, he had already redeemed Ruth. Ruth was redeemed when Christ died in her place. But like the prodigal son, she was, she was brought back. Even the prodigal son didn't return unto the father on his own. And there's one other thing I want to mention before. We're coming up now on, on winter. <clears throat> well, actually fall. Of course, we know that the Scripture, uh, contrary to the four seasons that we tend to look at, uh, the Bible looks at, at this as two seasons, summer and winter. But we're now in fall, officially in fall. We're going into the winter where that uh, we will, uh, if we're still here, we'll see a new spring. And I want to remind you folks of the fact that nowhere does it say that we were planted as, if you look at the planting, harvesting uh, times and seasons in ancient Israel, nowhere does it say in this book that we were planted as peas, chickpeas, olives, grapes, pomegranates, or oats, or any of that other stuff, but wheat harvested only, listen to me, wheat harvested only in May. Barley and wheat were planted in the autumn and ripened in spring. Naomi and Ruth returned unto, unto Judea. They got there at the beginning of the barley harvest. And barley and wheat were planted in the autumn and they were ripened in the spring. The book of Ruth, in my opinion, hints toward a spring rapture. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your kind messages and uh, of encouragement and support. I ask that you continue praying for the direction of this ministry. I thank you for all of your love and your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.